Three words. High school chemistry. How many of you experienced some elevated blood pressure, some mild anxiety? Does the thought of wearing lab goggles or the word stoichiometry just terrify you? If it does, you're not alone. <laughs> I learned in the past 10 years of being a chemistry educator that I'm not just facing a classroom full of students every day, I'm facing generations of chemistry PTSD. <laughs> This STEM stigma is something that I face all the time as a chemistry educator. I hear the words, chemistry is too hard for me, or I'm not good at math, or I'm not smart enough to study chemistry. These ideas are perpetuated by other students, by parents, even other teachers. And of course, I get always asked, do you know how to make meth? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Breaking Bad. But at least I have a guaranteed Halloween costume every year. <laughs> so these preconceived notions that students walk in have a huge impact on the way that they learn. There is so much educational research with significant data showing that when students walk in and have an attitude that something is going to be hard, it massively impacts their motivation and their performance. A chemistry classroom already looks different. It feels different, it even smells different, and so when they walk into the classroom thinking, I'm not going to be good at this, it's a self-perpetuating philosophy. Now, I believe that chemistry is for everyone, and so I wanted to figure out how do I address this chemphobia, this fear of science. And I realized that I was staring at it right outside this auditorium in Manitou Springs, mountains. We are, live in such a rich, beautiful place, surrounded by the foothills of Pikes Peak. As an avid rock climber and backpacker, I realized that we had rich opportunities to engage people and students with the chemistry and the outdoors and get them outside, rather than being relegated to a boring or dull classroom or lab. Just outside this auditorium in Manitou Springs, we're in the foothills of Pikes Peak, or Tavakiv, Sun Mountain, named by the Tavaguach Ute peoples who first populated this valley. And one of my favorite Ute legends, the Manitou, their deity, who had blessed the valley with the natural spring waters, were angered when one Ute warrior killed another. And so they cursed the spring waters, making them run red with blood of this murdered warrior. Now, the, according to legend, the Ute shaman traveled up on the plateau right outside this classroom and built a medicine wheel to draw out the curse. You can even still see it today along Intamin Trail. Now, Iron Spring, which runs along Ruxton, right below the incline, still tastes a little bit like blood because of the high iron content. And there's an interesting chemical explanation for this legend. When iron nitrate, commonly found in all the spring waters around Manitou, is mixed with another mineral, thiocyanate, it turns dark red, even with the viscosity of blood. So I realized that this was a powerful opportunity to engage students and people with chemistry, just by the experiences and doing the things outdoors that I already loved. Now I started to wonder how could I continue to engage students and people with chemistry instead of making it terrifying. Well, I found my next elevated opportunity to do chemistry outdoors in a very unlikely source, Diet Coke and Mentos. <laughs> if you've never seen this demonstration, it is a fantastic one. A couple of Mentos in a Diet Coke soda and a glorious geyser of foam erupts from the Diet Coke as the carbon dioxide is displaced. It's been made famous by Mythbusters, YouTube, and is super easy for students to replicate at home as well as in the classroom, or in my case, on the trail. A few years ago, I was speaking to a colleague at a conference, and he was also fascinated with this demonstration, and we devised a method to measure the volume of the foam produced by the Diet Coke and Mentos uh, experiment. One day, my colleague, who lives in Spring Arbor, Michigan, asked, do you live near any mountains? <laughs> well, it turns out he wanted to test the effects of altitude on the amount of foam produced by the Diet Coke and Mentos experiment. So I suggested I take the Diet Coke and Mentos setup and I hit the trail, going up Pikes Peak, measuring the volume produced in thousand meter increments, excuse me, thousand foot increments, thinking in science terms, 
And while well, he did some control experiments in Michigan where he lived, and the results were spectacular. Not only did we, the experiment produce nearly three times as much foam near the summit of Pikes Peak versus the control at 1,000 feet in Michigan, but it was fun to talk with about students, to share videos of me climbing the mountain, doing chemistry. They had data that they could manipulate and analyze and use to derive complex chemical calculations and conversions instead of just abstract textbooks or lab experiments. Students were wrapped with this experiment. They loved that they could replicate it, they could use it, they could see it and understand it. I will never forget one student who had been completely cynical and disinterested in chemistry turning to me and saying, not gonna lie, Mr. J, that was dope. <laughs> this student who had totally been disengaged with chemistry now was asking great questions, was proposing new experiments that could be done. I was so excited at how successful this was to get students excited about chemistry instead of terrified. And so the wheels started to turn. How else could I engage students and people with chemistry outside? Well, I believe that chemistry is all around us, everywhere. We're experiencing it all the time. And I realized that again, the answer was staring me in the face. Enter the Colorado Trail. 486 miles, over 89,000 feet of elevation, 12 mountain passes, eight wilderness areas, and some of the most rugged uh, terrain that the Colorado Rockies have to offer. I had long been obsessed with the idea of through hiking the Colorado Trail, and after the difficulties of teaching in a pandemic, a painful divorce, I realized that summer of 2021 was the perfect opportunity to go immerse myself in the mountains. I also realized that this was the perfect opportunity to take this experiential education and hit the trail. Now, experiential education is not something new. It's been used in Waldorf education. It's been used in Outward Bound and in Montessori schools for decades. But it's something that's lacking in the chemistry classroom, instead forcing students to be bored to tears or terrified. So I planned 12 chemistry experiments that could be done along the trail, easily accessing different features of the trail, um, everything from analyzing the uh, effects of sunscreen on ultraviolet radiation. Does that generic sunscreen really work as well as the name brand? Also looking at geology and geochemistry, water filtration, the effects of altitude on self-inflating balloons, and of course, more Diet Coke and Mentos. So I began to pack my pack and ended up with about 10 pounds of chemistry equipment. 40 pounds of backpacking equipment and food, and my dog Kuiper and I hit the trail. <laughs> it was amazing. We were immersed in all of the beauty of the Colorado Rockies. We had challenging climbs, insane sunsets, sparkling skies above us at night, seeing amazing wildflowers, and meeting incredible people along the trail, some of whom are here in the audience tonight. My dog Kuiper was absolutely in heaven, frolicking upon alpine meadows and finding new friends every day to throw sticks for him. It was incredible. And along the way, we engaged in our chemistry experiments. Now this quickly earned me the nickname, the professor on the trail. <laughs> I soon had gathered people along the trail, staring at me, wondering what I was doing as I unpacked my chemistry equipment or conducted my experiments. In one such experiment, a Cottonwood Pass, while testing the effects of altitude on self-inflating balloons, I had quite a crowd of people that had driven up the pass, staring at this smelly guy, wondering what he was talking about with gas laws and sodium bicarbonate. <laughs> on the 4th of July, I decided to set off some fireworks of the Diet Coke and Mentos kind, of course. So I hiked Mount Elbert, the highest peak in Colorado, and realized, much to my chagrin when I reached the summit, that I'd forgotten my Mentos. <laughs> so I spent 10 minutes walking around the summit asking people for Mentos candies. <laughs> Talk about some strange stares. I didn't find any, but it turns out that caramel M&Ms work just as well. <laughs> Sorry, Mentos. <laughs> Now, I was certainly jealous of all the people along the trail that I met who had hyperlight backpacks carrying all my chemistry equipment, but I was having so much fun that I didn't much mind. All of these experiments could be uh, replicated easily by students. They could be used in the classroom to manipulate data and understand chemistry in a different way that connected with students' real life experience. But most importantly, 
it addressed so many of these why questions that students have. They all too often go unaddressed or unanswered, swept under the rug by a parent who doesn't have enough time or a teacher that's annoyed and needs to get to the next lesson. But we need to engage students in a, a curiosity and encourage it. And so many of these experiences do just that. Students have loved all of the chem on the trails experiences that I've shared with them. It's inspired them to ask questions about how they can do these sorts of experiments, how they can manipulate this data and look at my experiences and now use this for their own chemistry learning. I hope that someday I get to encounter someone who tells me that chemistry is too hard or I'm not smart enough for chemistry, look them straight in the eye and say, go take a hike. Thank you very much. <laughs>